these were a few scenes from the science fiction horror movie Alien, produced by 20th Century Fox and filmed at the Shepperton Studios in England. Our documentary is going to show you some of my work behind the scenes. I was responsible for all the fantasy scenery in the movie and had to design the unknown planet, the wreck of the alien spaceship and its interior, and also the so-called egg silo and the different types of alien monsters. I made the first sketches and designs for the movie in my studio in Zurich after the first discussions of the project with the director, Ridley Scott. I flew to England several times where my paintings were appraised and we discussed possible alterations. These are a few variations of the alien figure I had in mind. They all emerged out of my personal visual world, which I call biomechanical. The egg silo, an unrealized project. Landscape of the unknown planet. The alien spaceship derelict. Details and structure of the derelict. Entrance of the derelict. Passage in the derelict. Cockpit with the remains of the unknown being who was her pilot. pilot's seat and the pilot in detail. Shaft with a membrane. The interior of the egg silo. Model of the egg silo. At Bray Studios, a group of specialists are making the models we needed for the special effects scenes. My colleague, P. Voise, will explain in a moment how these models are made and finally used in the movie. of using plasticine is we can bed pieces of plastic pipe into the plasticine and it holds quite well. Areas like this we use pieces of plastic tube, cut it, fit it in, fix it with polymer with nails or pins and then dress up to it with plasticine. This is being painted at the moment somewhere so it'll be finished off later. 
the more areas in here. We can cut into, into the polystyrene, we can cut through. This part of the alien spacecraft is an area that was made full size on a large stage at Shepparton Studios. The total height is about 12, 13 meters high from here to here. You get some idea of the scale. That little figure there is approximately the right scale. The landscape was built at Shepparton Studios. Some of it, anyway, it comes back as far as here. A lot more will be built on the stage here in model form, which will cover a large area. Inside Sherperton Studios, where movies like The Omen, Superman, and parts of Star Wars were filmed. Science fiction scenery is usually set up in huge studios called stages. Here, the models are built in their original size for the shooting of the scenes corresponding exactly to the previous design. The basic construction of the scenery begins with steel tubes and wood. Then the supports are covered with wire netting and finally with sacking soaked in plaster. To work out the final structure, we spread a mixture of dyed plaster and a gritty substance over the finished shapes with a mason's trowel. The more complex shapes are cut out of foam rubber and glued on. The general feeling here is really good and it's agreeable to work with these people. Tubes, only vaguely defined in the design, have to be integrated into the landscape and painted to fit in. Through the use of different smoke and water effects, the final decor achieves a really mystic atmosphere and is presented as follows. pilot in the cockpit. Using my design, P. Voise and I sculpt the pilot in his seat out of clay. Every detail is important because it has to show up well in the final mold. Next step is the job for the plaster casting team who have to make a mold from this figure. They're really working with terrific energy. To stabilize the forms, they insert strips of plaster soaked sacking. The hardened molds have to be carefully removed and all clay residue cleaned off to guarantee a perfect resin casting.
The remaining constructions are also built with wood, plaster and foam rubber. This man is carving out these technical looking trimmings with a lot of patience and skill. To create a homogeneous effect of the sculpture, I'm painting parts of it with a transparent sepia color. We have to use a crane attached to the ceiling to place the pilot, which was built separately, into the right position. The work has now progressed so far that it needs only a few cosmetic touch-ups to be ready for shooting time tomorrow. The egg, or rather eggs, we used about 120 of them for this set, are the organic repositories of the aliens in their first form of appearance, the so-called face hugger. In the workshop, probably I had just started during a proverbial tea break. The pieces of ground on which all the eggs stand, singly, are in the making. The professionals are watching my work with interest. Probably the realization of a design like mine is new to them. The original idea for the eggs opening was a kind of mobile elastic slit, but the production felt that this was too directly reminiscent of female sex organs and worried about possible censoring in Catholic countries. So we settled on a similar but crosswise shape, which satisfied both the Catholic countries and my own sense of forms. The face hugger. The design for the small alien monster named the face hugger is lying in wait inside the egg to be awakened out of its beauty sleep by the slightest touch of the astronaut's hand. It flings itself onto its victim, eating its way through the helmet and settles on the man's face forcing its long snout down into the helpless victim's throat in order to deposit its horrible seed. The cosmic incubation has begun. Having been a professional industrial designer, it means a lot to me to have a design show its symbolism as well as its functional aspect clearly. Therefore, 
I endowed the face hugger with the spring-like tail he uses to propel himself out of the egg, also with eight long-jointed fingers and two pulsing testicle-like appendages for the spores. The delicate mechanism of the fingers is moved by invisible strings and the pulsing comes from a small air pump. Interview with director Ridley Scott. When was the first time you saw Giga's work? Well, I'd never come across Giga's work at all. I'd been vaguely aware, once I'd seen it, of some artwork I'd seen earlier for a record sleeve, I think. Brain salad surgery, right? And it wasn't until I got to Los Angeles and I then knew I was going to be involved in the film. Uh, the thing about all these films, all monster films, or whatever you'd like to call it, is that uh, uh, the danger is how on earth are you going to finally do it? How are you going to make it, okay? And so that was one of the big concerns about how on earth it was going to be carried out, who was going to actually design it and create it. And I was shown the book, Necronomica. Necronomica, okay? Um, in Los Angeles, in fact, by O'Bannon, who brought it in, and I nearly fell off the desk, said, that's it, and uh, why look farther? And uh, so that's how I saw it. It was as simple as that. I've and never been so certain about anything in my life. <laughs> and what impressed you most about his work? Um, again, it's one of those things where I think it, the, there are a lot of, say, artists in this area and um, of Surreali surreali surrealism or, or whatever you like to call it and I think Giga has an extra quality of uh, I think one of the most frightening things of all is a, a quality of reality um, combined with a sort of his own form of fantasy and I think that's what makes it stronger is the, is the reality not the fantasy yeah? and uh, was it easy to work with him? Very, very and uh, in fact, I'm hoping that uh, maybe we'll do another film very soon. <laughs> and has the alien turned out as uh, you imagined? Yeah, I mean, you always aim for the alien or the film, the alien. The, the monster. The monster. Um, uh, we shouldn't call him the monster, he's better than that. So I think that's the first answer, that uh, he's better than a monster. He's far more primal and far more frightening and far more realistic, in a sense, than the idea of the monster and so I think yes he's turned out very well okay. better than I thought thank you <laughs> wow. my suggestions for the adult alien was generally approved by everyone the task of designing an elegant insectoid being that has nothing in common with the usual clumsy film monsters was solved. But we came to the conclusion that a creature without eyes, driven by instinct alone, would be far more frightening. That's why I painted a second version of the alien, which has no eyes. It's a lot easier to put down a fantasy in a painting than to translate such a creation into a costume that can be worn by a man. We realized this while constructing the alien's head. Now and then, our creation, it's a conglomeration of plasticine, technical parts, and a skull, is subjected to a very critical appraisal. We're constantly feeling the pressure of losing time. It has to be finished by such and such a deadline. And this often turns the problematic construction process into a nightmare. Finally, we've solved the technical problem. The rubber mold of the alien's head is lying ready for casting in the plaster shop. The mold is filled out with bits of fiberglass matting, 
and then daubed with polyester soaked brushes according to form. The head, now it's finally dried, has to be peeled out very carefully to prevent the delicate elements from breaking off. Five of these heads were made. I got to work every day at 8.30. My studio's in B stage. Two wooden partitions soon became an attraction for my co-workers' friends and families. I modeled the alien costume on a plaster statue of the seven-foot-tall Nigerian Bulagi. Its laborious, intricate work to fit on layer after layer of plasticine, to add in tubes, cables, vertebrae of snakes, and so on, in order to finally see the biomechanical alien from my imagination standing in front of me. Beside its toothed, flickering tongue, this creature also ought to have a tail it could use as a weapon. For this, I am using an animal vertebrae which appears to be flexible enough. All these countless formal elements are needed to result in a really complete alien costume. In the monster manufacturing department, my co-workers are brushing layer after layer of fluid latex rubber into these molds day after day so that they can finally extract the fruits of their work.
These are the legs of the costume. For a perfect fit, a bit of artistic tailoring is called for. Now my job is to join together the different parts in terms of the structures and colors so that the audience won't see a costume but a convincing, realistic being. In another studio, Carlo Di Marchi is working on the facial musculature of the monster. Because the creature is able to perform real movements, these have to correspond optically to the facial muscles. For this work, we're using contraceptives. Carlo Rambaldi with his crew. Probably Rambaldi's most famous mechanization is King Kong in the new movie version. He was awarded an Oscar for the mechanization of that ape and he also instilled life into our alien. The facial movements are controlled by hand through wires attached to a lever console. At last, the long-awaited first appearance of the alien on the scene. During the shooting, concentration is always very intense. Scott has given last instructions 
to the stuntmen. The acrobatic parts of the scenes are mainly played by a stuntman. And now, complete silence. Everyone present is watching events with great suspense. After the scene is shot and complete, everything gets torn down rather brutally and thrown away. You really have to be a seasoned professional to stand this sight without feeling some nostalgia. The next producer is already waiting at the door with his contract.